Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this dark and stormy night. Um, we are very, very excited to have uh, Scott Sanders in our midst tonight. Um, it was a thrill for me um, three years ago when I was watching the Tony Awards and Color Purple won Best Musical Revival and who would be at the podium but our gator, Scott Sanders. So we're just um, really thrilled that he's here. Uh, Scott is an Emmy, Grammy, and Tony Award winning television, film, and theater producer. His next film, the screen adaptation of Lynn manuel Miranda's Tony Award winning musical, In the Heights, hits movie theaters this summer. After graduating from UF's College of Journalism and Communications in 1979 with a BS in advertising, Scott moved to New York City and began a 15 year stint with the, rock, with the Radio City Music Hall. He the served. Rockettes? Is it I know, well, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I did a mental association there. Um, he served as executive producer, presenting some of the top artists of the 20th century, including, get this, Aretha Franklin. Whitney Houston, Madonna, Bette Midler, Frank Sinatra, Tina Turner, Sting, and The Grateful Dead. That's quite a mix. He made his first foray into the theater in 1990, producing An Evening with Harry Connick Jr. and his orchestra on Broadway. He has returned to Broadway many times since as an independent producer, perhaps notably with the musical adaptation of The Color Purple, which he co-produced with Oprah. He also produced the 2015 hit revival of that show, which went on to win the Tony Award, the one that uh, um, uh, Scott accepted, and also earned the top acting prize for its star, Cynthia Erivo, helping to catapult her to stardom. Last year, he returned to Broadway with his new musical adaptation of the iconic American comedy, Tootsie, which earned rave reviews and 11 Tony Award nominations, including Best Musical. On the film side, in addition to the upcoming release of In the Heights, next year he'll team up with Oprah Winfrey, Steven Spielberg, Quincy Jones, and Warner Brothers to bring his musical version of The Color Purple to the big screen. We are thrilled that Scott has come home and is here tonight as part of the Great Storyteller series. Joining him in a fireside chat is our Myra Lowe, who is Assistant Dean for Student Experiences at our college and Director of the Innovation News Center, a public media newsroom. Prior to joining UF, Myra was a senior editor at CNN Digital in Atlanta, and she was editor-in-chief of Jet Magazine in Chicago before that, where she became the first woman to helm the number one African American News Weekly. She also served as assistant managing editor for its sister publication, Ebony Magazine. Before they get started, um, I have some bling I want to put on Scott. Um, for the 50th anniversary of our college, we inducted our alumni <coughs> distinction into our Hall of Fame. Scott wasn't able to come, so Scott, I have your medallion. Oh if I can put it on you tonight. Congratulations. <laughs> Introduction and welcome back. Thank you. Thank to you. UF, Scott, and you want to run the um, the trailer? Yes, we do. Um, you going to run it? Hit it. What does Swanito mean? Swanito. It means little dream. That's it. No story. All right, all right, everybody sit down, sit down. It's a story, a block that was disappeared. In a barrio called Washington Heights, the streets were made of music. I am a snobby, and you probably never heard my name. Reports of my fame are greatly exaggerated. Morning, a snobby. I'm caliente, cafe con leche. On these blocks, you can't walk two steps without bumping into someone's big line. I make it moves, I make it deals, we just what? What? You still ain't got no skills. <laughs> I was saving up all my pennies and my piggy knife. It's damn. 
This is going to be an emotional roller coaster. The odds are against you. But there's a chance, right? A dream isn't some sparkly diamond. There's no shortcuts. Sometimes it's rough. It you're talking about kicking out all the dreamers. It's time to make some noise. We had to assert our dignity in small ways. Shh. Just listen. Little details that tell the world we are not invisible. Ignore anyone who doubts you. You know, I, I tend to gravitate towards stories of triumph over adversity or uh, stories that have great empathy inside the protagonist's journey. So <clears throat> I didn't produce In the Heights on Broadway. Some friends of mine did. But um, I was making a movie in, in Atlanta in 2013 called The Odd Life of Timothy Green for Disney. And I hired Lou Manuel to be a uh, an actor in a small role there. And we were on the set one day and he said, um, my, my first musical, one I wrote when I was 19 in college, started writing when I was 19 in college, in the Heights, um, was sold to Universal to be made into a movie and the, and the budget has ballooned up to $37 million and Universal's decided not to make it. It's too expensive. <clears throat> now again, this was 2013. Um, he said, would you like to produce it? And I said, of course I would. I'd love to produce it. And I thought I would set it up at Disney rather quickly, and then it didn't sell at Disney. So I took it around to 11 different studios, and all 11 of them said no. And then I went to Harvey Weinstein as the 12th. He bought it. Um, I brought, brought John Chu in to direct it. <clears throat> he wasn't as well known at that point because he hadn't done Crazy Rich Asians. But I called him Manuel and I said, do you know John Chu? And he said, my wife Vanessa and I went uh, on our first date to see his Step Up movies. So we love him, so go, go do it. So then um, Harvey's sex scandal exploded in 2017. We pulled it out of that studio in May of 18. I took it back out into the marketplace to sell it. Uh, we created a bidding war with Sony, Paramount, Warner Brothers, and got a $50 million sale with it at that point. Now let's remember that was post Hamilton. Um, the world had changed in Lynn Manuel's world, which the movie benefited from. And John was editing Crazy Rich Asians, and Warner Brothers was really happy with what they were seeing. So they gave us a lot of resources, more resources than we would have had at the Weinstein Company, so sometimes timing is wonderful, but I mean, I was, I was working on that movie for seven years, and um, you know, roughly six before we made it, and, um, but it was, but it's a really special film, and a lot of beautiful, beautiful cast, and a great choreography team, and a wonderful cinematographer, and I think it's a very compelling timely story for, for today. So um, we're excited. We tested it in uh, Pasadena in December and 
Dallas in January, and it's doing really well with focus groups. So, knock on wood that um, it does it does well this this summer. Great. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more later in the evening about what makes a great story, but we kind of sown the seed there a little bit. Um, we're going to be able to take questions. We'll talk, Scott and I will talk for a little bit, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, toward the end. So give me an opportunity to do that. So one of your big signature projects, as, as, as Diane said in the introduction, is the color purple. Mm -hmm. um, and we know the color purple. You co-produced that with Oprah Winfrey as um, the musical. And it was, everybody knows it's based on Alice Walker's Fourth of New Story uh, about an African-American woman um, in the South, in the 30s, Right, 1940, right, a 40 year span of her life in which she endured a <clears throat> abuse and hardship. Um, where did you get the idea to turn this sobering tale into a musical? You know, how did you think about wanting to do that and why? Uh, and what attracted you to that story? Well, you know, I, I read it, I graduated here in 79. Alice's book came out in 83. I read it when I was first in New York, and I had to read it a couple times at first because it's written in an epistolary form, Dear God Letters from Steely. And, and it's a hard story, as you said, it's a hard story to digest at first. Um, you have a woman in 1909 who's treated very poorly by a whole bunch of people, um, including her uh, forced to be husband, Mr. And, and I read it, and, but I felt like the story had a lot of music in its soul. And the thing that I loved the most about that character was that she was able to transcend her abuse and put one foot in front of the other and move forward every day. She didn't collapse. Um, she did have a crisis of faith. But at the end of the day, she was able to move forward. And I found that admirable. And then secondarily, I found admirable the fact that while she was going through that, she was also able to give love to others, whether it was Sophia or Harpo or Suge Avery. <clears throat> and she said so she wasn't, she didn't get bitter. And she didn't get to be a person who couldn't have any joy in her life whatsoever. And the third thing that I most admired was her ability to forgive. And by the end of the story, after all the things that Mr. has done to her, she ultimately forgives him. And, and I. And I found that remarkable and something that I aspired to as a human being. So while it wasn't the first most obvious medium to adapt it towards, I did feel like it had music in its soul. I remember when I was first getting the rights to it, but when I was first pursuing Alice Walker to get the rights, and um, I ran into Whoopi Goldberg, who's a friend, and I said, oh, I'm going to do Purple as a musical. And she said, oh, that's great. What's next, Schindler's List? And I'm like, oh, my God, really? From me, from you? So, so uh, it, was, it was an uphill battle where I had a lot of doubters. Um, I never doubted myself in it. I doubted whether I could pull it off and honor it properly. I certainly didn't want to be the white guy that screwed up the color purple. You know, that, that would have been a horrifying uh, uh, legacy to have, so, so I, 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 but I, but I did feel like that it was a universal story, not just for black people, not just for women, but that something we could all learn from and be moved by and, and be inspired by. Well, Scott and I had a conversation earlier, and I want to just I want you to take this a little further. One of the qualities you told me that you admired, uh, that is forgiveness. This quality that Celia had. Can you share a little bit about what Steven Spielberg told you about your version versus his, his version, how, how you chose to? Well, yeah, that was, and that was 2017, so that was just three years ago. I did the first production of The Color Purple in 2005. <clears throat> 2004, out of town in Atlanta, 2005 on Broadway. It played for three years on Broadway, then it toured for five more years, and then we did yet another tour for three more years. And, um, and then I went to London and reinvented and reimagined it in a smaller scale 
and brought it back to New York in 2016 with Cynthia Rebo. And Stephen had never been to the first version of it. And I got a call one day that he and Kate wanted to come to the show on Broadway with Cynthia Rebo and, and Jennifer Hudson. And they came and they saw the show. And I remember distinctly in his movie, the, at the end of the movie, there's a family reunion. And it's 40 years later from the beginning of the story. And a lot of things have happened in this, in this family. Ups and downs and people breaking up, people coming back together again. And, but one of the things that was remarkable to me in Alice's book was that she forgave Mr. And, which I thought was huge. And, and as a matter of fact, in the, in the novel and in our musical, Mr. comes by the picnic and Celie putting some blankets out on the, on the lawn, and he said, do you mind if I sit down? And she said, sure, what are you doing here? She, because clearly he had not been invited. But he stopped by and, and he said, um, I know you hate me for what I did to you. And she said, I don't hate you, Albert. Um, us live through it. And then he said, do you mind if I sit down? And he brought her a shell, he had a big conch shell. And, um, he said, I know you always loved the ocean, um, and they lived in rural Georgia where there was no water, but he said, I know you love the ocean. Um, I brought you this shell, I bought it out of a book, and it's a gift for you. And she puts it up to her ear and she can hear the ocean. And he said, I, I would like to ask you to marry me now, this time for real, not just in the flesh. And Celia looks across the blanket at him and she said, let's us just be friends. And but Mr. was actually at the reunion in the musical and in the novel. In Stephen's movie, he decides to banish Mr. Danny Glover is across the field, across the road, off the property, and he's standing in a field by himself looking back at this beautiful family that he's a part of but not a part of. And, and so Stephen looked at me and he said, you got it right. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, I put Mr. across the field. I didn't leave him in the family. And it's so much more moving and so much more real that he was actually in the, in the family reunion in your, in your musical. So, so now when we do the movie together, we'll, we'll do it with, in, in, in that way. But that, that really adheres to Alice's book. Um, so uh, I, my understanding, talking with you and reading a little bit about the process. This wasn't unusually, I don't know, maybe it wasn't unusual, but it was a long process to get this uh, produced. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, what it took to get the rights to this, and talk to us a little bit about how you got Alice Walker on board to get this done. <clears throat> well, she, she was, a, she was, she's not easy, um, and, I, and I love her, and she's a dear friend, but um, in 1997, um, so that would have been 14 years after the book was published and about 12 years after the movie came out, um, I was working in Los Angeles with Peter Goober. I was president of Mandalay Television and Peter was the chairman of the company and Peter had produced the film Color Purple with Quincy Jones. And I went into his office and said, I want to make it into a musical. Can you help me get to Alice Walker? And he said, you don't need to go to Alice Walker. You can go to my friend Terry Semmel at Warner Brothers, because when we bought the rights to the book to make the movie, all those underlying rights transferred to Warner Brothers. And I said, that may be the legal answer that you want to give me, but the human answer, the only answer that I will accept is, I need her blessing or else I'm going to do it. So I need you to send me to Alice Walker. So he called her, she lived in Berkeley, California, and uh, I flew up there and met with her for about an hour, and she served me tea, and she said, you seem like a really nice guy, but no. And, um, and I left, and I got my rental car, and went back to the Oakland airport, and flew back. And I was disappointed, and, um, and I, I, I forgot about it for a minute, and then, and then I called her one day, and I said, why did you say no? And she said, because A, I've moved on as an author, and I feel like I can't just sit in my most popular piece of work. I have to 
move forward and my energy needs to go <clears throat> into other ideas. And secondly, when I, she said, when the movie came out, I got a tremendous amount of criticism from black men saying that I vilified them. And I think unfairly, but, but that's what happened. And I don't want to go through this again. So I said, what if I um, flew you to New York and we spent a week together and went to see shows and we could talk a little bit more about my vision for the piece? And she said yes to that, which I was surprised because normally no is no and, and after that is stop calling me. But she didn't say that. She said, okay, I'll, I'll come. And so I flew to New York and lined up a bunch of shows to see and um, picked her up at her hotel and she said, oh, get three tickets for, for the shows. I'm going to bring a friend. I thought, oh my god, I hope this friend is a, you know, someone that wants this to happen versus like whispering in her ear not to do it. And um, I get to the, we go to see uh, Bring Into Noise, Bring Into Fun the first night. And I get to the front of the theater and Alice walks up with her friend. Her friend was Gloria Stein. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm here with Alice Walker and Gloria Stein. I'm going to the shows with Alice Walker and Gloria Stein. And we spent the week going around and seeing shows. And I told her that there were two parts of the story that I wanted to change from the film. And one was the relationship between Celia and Suge. I felt that it was not, um, not really fully uh, uh, shown in the movie. And it's not a criticism of Steven necessarily because making that movie and getting that movie financed in 1985 was probably a Herculean feat that only Quincy and Stephen could have had made. But indeed, they didn't really represent the novel in the relationship that Celie and Shug really had with each other. And it's the first time that Celie falls in love with another person who loves her back. And so as a character, I felt like it was a really important story point that needed, needed to be expressed in the proper way, in the way that Alice intended it. So I said, I will do this in the theater. The theater is very progressive, and we can do whatever we want to do on Broadway. So I want to move that story arc into a, a more representative form that the, that the book had. And the second thing I thought was the most intriguing <clears throat> was her comment about how black men felt they were being, uh, being portrayed in the, in the story. And, and I said, you know, I went back and I watched Stephen's movie a lot, and I reread your book several times. And in truth, you've got three generations of men in this story. The, the first one is old Mister, um, sharecropper, who becomes a first-time landowner and clearly treats women like chattel, um, cared a lot about the fact that his land and keeping his land up and not doing anything to embarrass yourself or get yourself into trouble. <clears throat> you have Mr. the Glover character, who really was in love with Shug Avery. His father said, you can't hang out with her, she's a whore. And his first wife, who he really married to have kids and to look after the house, she gets shot. We don't even see that in the story, but she dies. So by the time we meet him, he's bitter that he can't be with Shug Avery. He's got kids running around his house. House is a mess. He feels like he needs to get another wife quickly. He falls in love with Nettie, Celie's sister, younger sister, goes to the house and asks their father for Nettie's hand. The father says, you can't have Nettie, but you can have Celie. And he says, I don't want Celie, she's ugly. And he says, um, I'll just buy your cow. And he said, you marry Celie, I'll give you that cow. I mean, how horrible is that? And he takes Celie home, and so he's an angry man, and Celie's there, takes care of the house, um, but he's, he's really not much different than his father. Treats women poorly. And then you have Harpo, and Harpo is this young kid, uh, the son, who in Spielberg's movie is sort of a comic foil. He, falls through the roof of the gym joint. He's sort of a clown. And I thought, why don't we change Harpo? Why don't we really, really show Harpo for the man that he is, which is indeed, not only is he not like his grandfather, not like his father, he chooses the most powerful, forward-thinking, 
um, aggressive feminist in town in the role of Sophia, the Oprah Winfrey character. So I said, why, why don't we show the distinction between this next generation of men in this family and realize that there's hope that there's going to be some kind of adjustment in the way that they're treating women and the way that they're looking at life. And so if we build out Harpo and we show the juxtaposition between old Mr. Mr. and Harpo, I think we can get away from this criticism. So we spent the rest of the week together and, um, and then for, I think Saturday night I chartered a yacht to do a cruise around Manhattan and I invited all my friends that work in, in, the, um, in the theater business. The owners of the Nederland organization, Schubert organization, um, Rocco Landisman from Drew Jamson, um, a few other fun ones. I invited Diana Ross and her two daughters. And I said, Alice, just spend the night on this boat as we circle Manhattan and ask everybody you want whether they think this is a good idea or not and what they think of working with me. And if you find at the end of this week that you don't want to do it, then I did my best, but, but if, if I'm hoping you will do it. And so she did, and then the next night we had supper together, and she said, all right, I trust you, I'm going to let you do it. And so then, that was a, I mean, I couldn't believe that it finally happened, and then my lawyer says, well, you only got to first base, you need now Warner Brothers, and you need Steven Spielberg. And Warner was sort of an easy second base, and then, I, and then I thought, oh my god, I know how this is going to fall apart. Spielberg's going to say no. And, and I was only, I, I was taking money out of my personal savings account to do this. And I had negotiated a $25,000 license fee for the book. And I didn't try to get the rights to the movie because I just thought it was too expensive and I couldn't afford it. And I got a call one day in my office. And my assistant came in and said, I don't know if this is a hoax or not, but... Steven Spielberg's on the phone. And, and I answered the phone, he said, why aren't you asking for the rights to my movie? I think this is a great idea that you're doing it. I said, I don't think, in all due respect, I don't think I can afford your movie. And he said, you can have my movie for the same $25,000 that you're paying Alice for the book. So I got all of those pieces together, and, but that took, that took two years. And the entire process was like a 10 year process. The entire process was eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Um, so, The Color Purple, uh, the path, we you know it started as a book, it was adapted into the dramatic film, you then adapted it to a musical, and now you're going to adapt your musical back into a movie. I know, it's right? funny. Yeah. So, uh, why do you want to do that? And, and, uh, yeah, why? Why, why? why do you want to do that? Well, you know, living in the world today, I mean, this has been sort of going on for the last two years. Oprah and I have been conspiring to figure out how to get that done. Um, and once again, Mr. Spielberg needed to say yes in order for that to happen. And, um, and it felt like the story is timeless. It felt like the story can't be told enough. It feels like in today's world, that a new generation should and would enjoy seeing it. So one of the things, my musical has played North America extensively. We played Britain. We've now played South Africa, which is a big goal of mine. Um, it's now run three different engagements at the Nelson Mandela Theater in Johannesburg. Um, it will play China soon. Um, but it hasn't really penetrated the larger global platform and a movie really lets you do that and so I thought if we tell this story again women in China, women all over the world, people all over the world, young people, older people um, can see this movie and and I think it's a classic that is worth repeating. And we're going to move on from The Color Purple but I do want to give you the opportunity to talk about, you, talked, you gave me an example earlier about um, an exchange that Gail King had why uh, with um, some uh, theater goers about The Color Purple. What, why do you think the story just plays so well across platforms or mediums or contexts? I mean, what is it? What I, think it's, I think it's a, a class, you know, it's interesting because I have a lot of doubters. 
excuse me, over the years, who said, why are you doing this? It's a 14-year-old girl who gets raped by her stepfather in the first 10 minutes. It's really depressing. Uh, it's an all-black cast. African-Americans don't traditionally go to the theater. What are you doing? You've got to raise $11 million. Why are you doing this? And, and I said, I think this is a racist comment. And they said, well, what do you mean I'm not racist? And I said, no one argues whether Shakespeare stories, what color they are. I said, this is a classic triumph over adversity story. You read the Bible, you read The Alchemist, you read Shakespeare. They're classic stories with archetype characters. And because it is about an African-American community in Georgia in 1909 to 1949, and a protagonist that is this young woman who does have these horrible things happen to her, I think by the time we get to the end, there's incredible inspirational stories and messages that come from it. And so I, my goal is to produce this in a way that a broad audience will see it. And indeed, that's what happened with a lot of help from Oprah, quite frankly, in New York. I mean, I'll tell you an anecdote. In 2004, the show opened in December of 2005 on Broadway. In December, in every year, the Broadway League, which is the professional organization I belong to, and we produce the Tony Awards and all that, they do a demographic survey. And each year, they'll tell you, you know, X percent or European tourists, X percent or this age, X percent or this color or this gender. And traditionally, you know, for years and years and years, it's sort of been 50-year-old white women are the prime target for ticket buyers. Doesn't mean they're all the people that go, but they're the decision makers. That's come down a few years over the years, largely, I think, because Disney has moved into Broadway and brought the demographic down a little bit. And Lynn manuel with Hamilton has brought the demographic down a little bit. But in 2004, the year before Color Purple opened on Broadway, all 30 shows combined on Broadway, just guess what the representation was from African American ticket buyers. I mean, I was startled. It's 3.8%. I mean, almost negligible. And when Oprah first said to me, how can I help you with this show, I said, we've got to get this show into double digits. And indeed, when we opened Color Purple in 2005, the mix was about 50-50. So we did more than 10%. We did 50-50. And buses from Atlanta and Dallas and Louisiana and North Carolina and DC and Baltimore were coming into town for the day sometimes and bringing 40, 50 people at a pop to see the show. And that continued in the eight years of touring. So again, it was important to me that we were telling a story about a community, that that community would actually have the opportunity to see it. But at the same time, I also wanted um, a broader audience to see it because it was important. So we literally changed the look and feel and color of Broadway in 2005. How many of you in here have seen the movie Tootsie? Oh, that's pretty good. Um, so last year you brought Tootsie to the stage. Um, whose idea was that? And what were you hoping to accomplish by, by doing that? Well, you know, again, I, I, I wanted to do an iconic comedy. And Tootsie is um, recognized by the American Film Institute as the second best comedy film ever made. <clears throat> um, Some Like It Hot is their first. And, and I was chasing that project 20 years ago, along with another dozen producers, and none of us could get anywhere in getting the rights. And literally one day, 10 years ago, I get a call from Larry Gelbart, and Larry wrote the screenplay with Don McGuire. Larry also created and wrote MASH, and a funny thing happened on the way in the forum and numerous other, he's one of those remarkable artists who could write equally as well in film, TV, and theater. And so he said, do you want to make my, do you want to make my uh, story into a musical for Broadway? 
I said, Larry, I've been chasing this project for years, never could get anywhere with it. How is it possible that you're now offering it to me on a silver platter? He said, well, I don't have the rights to the movie or the title. I just have my screenplay. Do you want to buy it for $100,000? And I did, and I called my lawyer, and my lawyer said, you can't buy it unless you get the movie and the, and the title as well. And that was tied up with Sony. So I couldn't get them on board initially, but I decided to buy the screenplay anyway, much against my lawyer's wishes. And I had this, and I had Larry Gelbart, this brilliant creative genius who was going to write the musical for me. And six months later, without any knowledge whatsoever, we were literally putting the press release together for announcing this, um, Larry died on September 11 of 2003, maybe, 2002, 2003. So now I have this screenplay, no Larry, no title, no movie. And, um, I, 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 and then his wife asked me, would you produce Larry's memorial at the Academy in LA? And I'm, you know, on the phone with Mel Brooks and, and, and all of these amazing, Sid Caesar and all of these, Carl Reiner, all these amazing comics who were Larry's friends and peers. And I'm putting this memorial together and I'm thinking, maybe I just won't do it. You know, maybe I need to just write this off. I shouldn't do it without Larry. And then um, I had dinner. Larry's wife said, come to our family Gelbart dinner. And it's all the kids and all the grandkids and everybody around the table. And I said, I'm thinking about not doing it. And they practically jumped across the table and said, you have to do it. Larry will want you to do it. And so I decided, OK, I will. And then I went about getting, I got Sony on board, and then the next hard one, the same story I told you before, my Steven Spielberg was now Dustin Hoffman. So I had to get Dustin degree to do it. And his agent said, um, he's filming a show for HBO at a racetrack. I don't even remember what the name of it was. You need to drive down to Santa Ana and meet with Dustin and tell him why he should give you the rights to it. So I get in my car and I'm driving. There's horrible traffic in LA. I'm driving, driving, driving. And, and the agent called again and said, oh, by the way, Dustin is going to be in character. He won't break character when he's talking to you. And I said, will his character know what Tootsie is? And and they said, well, you just have to go. So I go down and I meet with him. He finally says yes. I get the rights. And then I had to put a new creative team together um, to do that. So we, we opened that in Chicago, two falls, uh, fall of um, 18. And then we opened it on Broadway in the uh, spring of 19. And now it's going to go on tour. We have 80 weeks booked starting in September of this year. It will tour all through North America um, in the, you know, the major cities. So, um, just based on what you've talked about, you're, as a producer, your projects have run the gamut, you know, across genre, um, across topic. Are there through lines or themes that you gravitate to with the projects that you pick? And how do you decide what project you want to go for anyway? You know, it's so subject art is so subjective, and so my decision making is so subjective. And, and I've come to the conclusion that there's no bad idea; it's just bad execution or good execution. And so, <clears throat> I mean, if you think about you think about if someone would have walked into your office five years ago and said, "I want to do a musical freestyle rap." about Alexander Hamilton. And I think it's going to be huge. You would have thrown him out of your office, probably. So Lynn was smart enough to write it on his own, put it up on his own, and then it turned into what it did. So my color purple example is, is a testament to tenacity, resilience, not letting go, believing in something. And, and, and I, I believed in all of them. The reason, the stories I like to tell usually have a very strong emotional component to it. Um, purple, heights, um, 
Tootsie less so because it's because it's a comedy. Although there's a lesson that Michael learns. Michael goes in and puts on the wig and the dress and cheats in order to get a job because he's desperate. He's just turned 40 and he's being told by everyone from his friends to his agent, no one will work with you. And he basically says, I'll show you, I will do this. Now, was his behavior and his choice and his judgment good or correct? No. By the end of the story, does he learn something from it? And he says to Julie, who he mostly hurts in the course of the story, um, I had to become a woman to become a better man. So he had to, he learned something from it. It doesn't excuse his behavior, but it gives you a sense of how someone can grow over the arc of a story. Clearly, Seeley goes from a victim to a very empowered, self-loving individual um, that we all would want to aspire towards. And um, In the Heights is also a, another great story. All of our community, but you know, Usnavi in particular, he thinks, in, initially, his father had a little bar in the Dominican Republic. His father has passed. He moved to New York, opened up this bodega. He's everybody's friend. He gets them their coffee every morning. He's got a girl he's sort of interested in. There's all these other wonderful characters. He's got an abuela who's not really his abuela, but he lives with her, and she, he treats her as though she is. And all of these folks are living in this little cul-de-sac, if you will, that's a neighborhood that's gentrifying, a neighborhood where if there's a blackout, they're the last neighborhood to have the lights turned back on. Um, and so they have, they're struggling. But there's, you know, as he says in the trailer, um, it's, it, the streets are made of music. And they, and they find joy and they find the light in their lives on a daily basis, even when there's not light there, literally or figuratively, <coughs> each day. <clears throat> so I find those kind of inspirational stories what I usually gravitate towards. And um, it doesn't matter to me, you know, the protagonist's age or race or gender. I just think, again, it's my job to ignore the people that say, well, demographically, this is who goes to movies, so this won't work. Demographically, this is who goes to the theater, this won't work. Demographically, this is who watches daytime television, so this won't work. And my feeling is, not to sound too cliche, but if you make it and it's good, they will come. I mean, it's also my job to promote the hell out of it. I mean, as you see, you know, I'm not bashful for getting Oprah to be my producing partner on, on Color Purple. I'm not bashful to get Lin-Manuel to do a cameo. He wasn't going to be in this movie. He said, I'm not going to be in the movie. I'm doing a series in Wales. And we talked him into doing it. He really had a great time. He ended up being on set most days. And so I think sometimes if you've got a challenging story or project and you know it's challenging, the answer is not necessarily to walk away from it. It's my, my, my attitude is always, okay, I get that it's challenging. I love knowing that they're headwinds. I love understanding that they're headwinds and acknowledging the headwinds. Because if you don't acknowledge the headwinds, then you're just blindly walking into a trap, usually. But if you know what your headwinds are, and then you go about systematically figuring out, how do I overcome that? What do I need to do a end run around that headwind? And that's been a lot of my work in, in it's certainly in the marketing side of my projects. So that's a great segue into my next question for you. Um, let's rewind a little bit, uh, going back to when you were a student here. You were an advertising major. Mm. Um, why did you choose advertising, and, and what are some of the lessons maybe you learned that impacted your eventual work? When I was in, in high school and junior high in, in St. Petersburg, I largely thought I was going to go into politics. And I kind of thought, you know, I, I'll go to law school and, you know, my, my big dream at 16, 17 was I want to be the governor of the state of Florida. And, um, and then when I was here, I wasn't out, but I was, I, 
I was pretty sure I was gay, and I wasn't, and I was pretty sure that you can't go into politics as a gay person. So I love music, and I love marketing, and I love promotion, and I love eventizing. That's a made-up word, I suppose. And I and I got I got three catalogs when I was looking at schools, um, two in state, um, FSU in here, and UNC Chapel Hill, and. I applied to all three. Um, it was interesting to me that in, in Florida State, the advertising, I looked through the curriculum really carefully, and I loved the way this, the classes were described in Gainesville at University of Florida, much more than all of them. And, um, and I also really loved the fact that advertising was in the journalism and communication school. In, in FSU, it's in the business school. And, um, which there are certainly merits to having a business degree or a business um, sensibility. But, you know, I was editor of my newspaper in high school and all of that jazz, and I loved journalism, and I was a DJ at the radio station, so the journalism and communication school felt more like a home for me. And, and so even though I really loved the trees and the topography of, of Tallahassee, um, I chose this because I thought the program made more sense for me. And I actually applied, well, UNC wrote me a very sweet letter and said, we don't typically accept out-of-state students very often, um, and we're not going to accept you. And so, um, and so I came here, and, and it was, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that I came here. And, and as I was hanging out with my fraternity brothers earlier, Pi Kappa Alpha earlier tonight, and talking about how when you come from, I mean, my friend Becky went to high school with me. We went to Gibbs High in St. Pete um, right after desegregation was kicked into gear in, in Florida. And um, so it was a thousand person um, high school. And so moving to Gainesville, moving out of town, moving, moving out of your family's home, having to do your own laundry, you know, all of those things, having a roommate, um, and then coming to a 30,000 person university could be and, and did feel a little overwhelming initially. So finding small pockets of community, so whether that was, um, I was part of ADS, the advertising organization here, being in the university, going to work at WGGG here, having friends in the Alligator and, and the RUF and all of that, and then the fraternity having, again, smaller communities that you can start to, in some ways, I feel like that's when I really grew up. I feel like I became a more seasoned human, ready for the world um, in, the, in that time frame. So having the opportunity to use marketing and use advertising and use promotion and, and figuring out how, and how to do that here as a stepping stone, and, and, and I would say without question, my advertising campaigns class was the most important experience academically that I ever had because it was a practical experience for a semester where you were going to be judged by a real third party, outside real world potential uh, business people. And that taught me a lot. Um, you know, it's funny, I got in trouble in that class. Um, we, 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 um, that class, uh, at campaigns, first day you divide into five person agencies and you get a real life um, client that comes in. And in, the, in that time, it was the predecessor for Time Warner Cable. So this was 1978, 79. Um, cable was not as prevalent as it is today. There was still a lot of antennas on the side of people's houses. So they wanted a campaign to convince people to get cable. And our agency group worked as hard as all the other, there were four other ones, and we were killed ourselves. I never pulled so many all-nighters in my entire life in that, in, in, in that semester, making, with you know, limited financial resources of our own, making ads, making videos, doing all kinds of stuff with um, just school resources. And at the very end, um, we were gonna have the presentations to the client. And the, um, typically and historically, 
those presentations happen in the classroom. And I don't know what came over me, but I came over to the Rights Union and rented a room here and got wine and cheese and crackers and refreshments and asked for the client to come to the Rights Union for our presentation. And we made the presentation. We actually won the competition. And, um, and that weekend, the second place team called um, our, our professor and said, we want to register a complaint. We think group one should be disqualified because they came over to the rights union and they bribed the client. So the professor called me, I think it was a Saturday, and said, I'm weighing this very carefully. Um, I need to take it seriously. And I said, I just have a question for you. I, you know, we didn't bribe anybody. I said, Are you, is, I mean, this is my last class. I'm graduating in four weeks. Is, is this not the class that's supposed to get us ready for the real world? And do you think for a second, if we were an ad, at an ad agency anywhere from Tampa to Boston, that you would walk into a room with not a glass of water, with not a Coke, with not, without anything, and sit in some boring room with chairs and a table and pitch your account? Like, who would get that job? And I said, so if you want to disqualify us, disqualify us. Like, I'm graduating anyway. And then, and then he called on Monday and he said, I'm not disqualifying you guys. You, you guys won. But it was, but so now I will never forget that when I'm in this building. <laughs> um, so, so you take all that you've learned. Uh, we like to call that experiential learning here immersions. Right? <laughs> immersions. <laughs> um, You've taken that experience and you're graduating and right out of school, right out of college, you land at Radio City Music Hall, right? Which was a very strange set of circumstances. That is an, an unusual, maybe, move for a college student coming out of Gainesville to land in New York City at Radio City Music Hall. So tell us a little bit of how did that happen? What was that first job? What was that, what were you doing? Well, as you, as you can imagine, I assumed I was going to go into the ad agency business. <clears throat> and I, and I applied, <clears throat> my goal was to go work at an agency, I don't even know if it's still in existence, it's called McDonald and Little, and they were in Atlanta and they handled all the weird things the McDonald's account. No relation. And, um, but in the course of my senior year putting my resume out, I got a job offer at Disney World in their marketing department. The actual, the, the, the client for campaigns offered me a job to um, be a marketing director for the company in either Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, or Denver, or of all weird places, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And they flew me to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, where I got out of the car and a man picked me up. The man who picked me up was the owner of the cable company in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And, we're, and I've, I've gone to Denver to meet with them that day, and then I went to Champaign-Urbana, and by the end of the night, I'm in Fond du Lac. And I'm so tired. And, and the man, we're in the car, we're driving down the road, and he says, look out the window and tell me why we're gonna be successful. And all I kept thinking was that plastics line in the graduate. Like, I said, well, I, I can't, I'm too tired to, for this riddle. What's the answer? And he said, see all those rabbit ears, see all those antennas, we're going to get rid of all of them. So I thought that's where I was going. And, but spring break of my senior year, um, a weird part of my past came back. When, um, when I was going to school with Becky in, in, in St. Pete, the band I hired for our senior prom, I ended up being their manager, and which wasn't really a thing while I was going to university here. They were working clubs in St. Pete Beach, and they made like $1,000 a week, and they said, why don't you, um, why don't you be our manager and get us some more money? And so I thought, without knowing anything better, well, I bet if I got them a job at Disney World, they'd make more money. So I kept calling the buyer of talent at, at in Orlando, and he never returned my phone call. And when I was a junior here, my fraternity had a 
big conference in, in San Francisco. And after that conference, I popped down to LA and I went to visit record companies, thinking, well, maybe I'll work at a record company. And I met with several record companies, and one of them hired me as a college promotion rep for Gainesville here. here. And one day out of the blue, some guy called me and said, I'm your boss in, in Miami. I'm the head of promotion for the record company. And we have a band playing Disney World. And this weekend, you need to go over and cover them. And I said, what does cover them mean? You need to go over and be nice and, and, and tell them you work for the record company. And, and so I did. And in the course of that evening, I met the man that didn't return my phone call. And I said, you are the guy that has not been returning my phone calls. And he said, have lunch with me tomorrow at Tomorrowland Terrace. And I did, and he said, at the end of the lunch, why don't you come work for me as my assistant? And I said, because I'm still in college and I need to graduate, and no thank you, but thank you. So I sent him my resume, and unbeknownst to me, Radio City Music Hall in 1978, the year before I graduated, lost a million dollars in New York. It was owned by the Rockefellers. They were not happy. They were going to close it down. They wanted to close it down. And they probably wanted to build another 65-story skyscraper mirroring the 30 Rock building. And again, before my time, without my knowledge, the Lieutenant Governor of New York um, went and got the Landmarks Commission to landmark the Art Deco interior of the building suddenly telling the Rockefellers, you will not be building any skyscraper here. So they went and hired this guy named Bob Yanni, who lived in Orlando and, and Los Angeles, Anaheim. And he produced all the entertainment for both parks, Disneyland, Disney World. He did the electric light parade, all kinds of stuff like that. Super Bowl halftime shows. And uh, so he called me spring break of my senior year and said, Sonny Anderson has given me your resume. He's worked for me for 35 years. He's never given me a resume before. Can you come to New York and meet me to talk about a job? And I'd never been to New York before. And went there spring break of senior year. And in the course of that evening, he said, why don't you come be the talent booking coordinator for Radio City and make 350 bucks a week? And I said, what's the job? He said, You'll audition singer-dancers, you'll hire Rockettes. And I'm thinking, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> and, um, and, and you'll work for me directly, which in a corporate setting, coordinators don't work for presidents. Um, so I had these other things that felt like they were more in line with what I was majoring in. And um, my mom said, no, go to New York, take the, take the Radio City job. And I did. And, and I was there for a few months, and literally all the promotion stuff suddenly came rushing back. Because at the end of the day, if you're selling something, no matter what it is you're selling, you have to know marketing. You just have to understand the ins and outs of all of it, including press. So the, the first show I did was Diana Ross, and I brought her to Radio City. And Again, I'm now working with the publicist, taking her to radio stations, taking her to the Today Show, working with the ad agency, making ads for her. And then that continued with all different kinds of folks, including bringing the Grateful Dead in for, for Halloween with Al Franken as a host of a simulcasted show. So I, I knew enough about marketing and promotion and advertising that if you can take one plus one plus one and have it equal 10, that, that's usually the formula for figuring out how to eventize something. So you get the Grateful Dead, you marry that with Radio City, which is a non-traditional Art Deco palace for them to be performing in. You get Al Franken from Saturday Night Live to be the host of the thing. Then, and then some weird shit happened, like, like, the mayor calls David Rockefeller and says, what are you doing? Why are there a thousand people sleeping in sleeping bags in Central Park? What are you doing? And David Rockefeller calls me and says, what's happening? And I said, they're deadheads, and they don't get hotel rooms. And so that's where they are. Well, you have to stop this. So 
but it but it was it was fun to play with the I mean I was really fortunate to be in the most important music entertainment capital of the country, um, in the greatest theater in the world, and resources from the Rockefellers that I could have only dreamed of. And I'm 22 years old, and I don't know what I don't know in a lot of instances, and so it was just fun to just try stuff. And each time I tried something, for the most part, it worked. So then they would say, well, then do more of that. So, so that was that was really how it all happened. And you basically then created that model for growth at Radio, Sim Radio City Music Hall, right? Because you were saying um, you were noticing they were attracting just a limited audience, right? An older audience. And through what you're thinking about, that's how you were able to grow and attract younger audiences, newer audiences. And so I want you to talk a little bit about that model you created. And a side note, talk to me about the Super Bowl in Michael Jackson. Oh, okay. Um, so, so, um, so it helps to be 22, 23, 24 years old. <clears throat> I have a lot of new friends in New York, and they would say, where do you, you know, where do you work? And I have friends at Saturday Night Live, and the 80s in New York was crazy and fun, and, um, you know, clubs and blah, blah, blah. And none of my friends were going to Radio City. It was the Rockettes, Christmas show, Easter show. And it was a tourist attraction, a successful one, but a tourist attraction by and large. And you know, something your grandmother would take you at Christmas time to go see. And and I went into Bob one day and I said, really again, not not really understanding. It was an instinct, but it wasn't a fully fleshed out idea. I said, um, I think there's a real room. There's real room for us to go after people my age with programming here, but you're not doing it. And he said, do you want to do it? And I said, all right. And so then they gave me a budget, and then I said, all right, Grateful Dead, Diana Ross, Madonna, you know, on and on and on. And the show started selling out like crazy. There were a lot of politics involved, icky politics with the concert promoting business in New York City. A lot of bribery on the other with my competitor, and we're the Rockefellers. We don't bribe, and I don't bribe. So there was a lot of that that I was dealing with. But at the end of the day, within three years, I had 50% market share in the concert business in New York, and so that that was really fun to watch that happen and to change. And it, and, and and one of the other things that ties back to my history in the African American space is that the politics that were imposing on me early on. So when I tried to bring, I'm even making up, James Taylor or those Linda Ronstadt to Radio City, the agents would say, you can't have them. They're Ron Delster's acts. Ron Delster was the established number one concert promoter in New York. So I started calling the musicians I liked. And I called the Commodores, and I called Cool in the Game, and I called Aretha. Night and I started bringing, and they didn't have the same allegiance to Ron. So suddenly, we were the number one because those artists, by and large, were playing the Beacon or City Center, and they were. And once they walked into the Music Hall and saw how gorgeous it was, everybody wanted to play there. So I actually did a lot of African American black music shows in the first couple of years, and then and then we broke the dam with the politics of it, and then I got Linda Ronstadt, and then I got all the big bands, and <clears throat> you know, Journey, and all those other bands at the time. Um, and, and so that was, so that was that. The, the Michael Jackson thing was sort of weird also. I was, um, the year before, that was in 1993, and in 1992, the halftime show format was radically different. You know, it was up with people, and marching bands and kind of boring stuff. And in 1992, there was a show on Fox called In Living Color. And In Living Color did a really smart stunt. They said, we're going to do a live show minute by minute against the halftime show. I think the halftime was, I can't remember which channel the game was on. And they basically told you, and they taught, partnered with Lay's Potato Chips. And they basically said, we're gonna, Lays is gonna come on TV, 
and tell you, second quarter is over, change to channel five, and watch 30 minutes of In Living Color, and then we'll tell you to come right back to the game, and you'll go right back to the game, and you won't miss a second of the third quarter. And they beat the hell out of the Brady twice. I mean, it was an embarrassment. So the NFL is panicky. That was piece one of the puzzle. Piece two of the puzzle is the 1993 Super Bowl had been awarded to Phoenix, Arizona. And that very year, Arizona voted down the Martin Luther King State holiday. So now the NFL is going to, it seems like they can continue to be in the same problem for decades. So they have this problem with, with their players, and they decide smartly they're going to pull the game from Phoenix and put it at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. So I get a call from some guy, I don't even know how he knew me, at Radio City, from the NFL, and he said, I need to meet with you in our offices. And they were over on Park Avenue. And I went over and he said, I want you to produce the Super Bowl halftime next year. And I said, I don't do marching bands and pom-pom girls. Like, that's not what I do. And they said, no, no, we want you to change the format. What do you want to do? And I said, well, um, I would give a single artist or two artists 100 yards of gridiron and do a big, splashy show. Like who? And I gave him Michael Jackson, um, Mick Jagger and Tina Turner together, and I think Bette Midler with a thousand wheelchairs with mermaids in them, I think is the third. And he said, we'll go with Michael Jackson. Can you get Michael Jackson? <clears throat> and I said, well, I know his manager really well, and um, let me try. What's the budget? It's a million dollars. How much for Michael? There's no money for Michael. It's a million dollars for the to produce the show. You spend it all on the show. And um, so I called him up and I said, "Hey, Michael, this he's got a brand new album out. Um, I want you to do the suit. How much do you pay? There's no money, but there's a million dollar budget. Well, why would we do that?" And I said, "You have a brand new album coming out. Are you going to do the Grammy Awards? Of course we're going to do." Are you going to do the American Music Awards? Of course we're going to do the American Music Awards. And I said, what do they pay Michael? An after payment of, what, $365? Well, yeah, but it's the Grammys and it's the American Music Awards. I said, Sandy, the Super Bowl has 1.3 billion eyeballs. It may, you can take the Grammys 10 times over, and it won't equal the rating. He said, really? And I said, this is the problem when two gay guys talk about a Super Bowl right now. <laughs> so the next scene, I go to LA, and I meet with Michael and Sandy. And I said, I want you to sing Black or White, and I want you to do um, We Are the World, and blah, blah, blah. And we put the show together, and it ended up having the highest ratings of, of, of Super Bowl history, and um, ultimately changed the paradigm for how the NFL now does Super Bowls. I mean, that was, what, that was uh, seven, tw 27 years ago. And now they're doing Shakira and, and, and uh, J-Lo in a similar fashion. They've never gone back to that format before. So it was, it was really, really fun to do. It was exciting to do. It's scary to do because you literally have four minutes from the end of the second quarter to change over the field and bring all your stuff in and everything has to be bolted and on wheels and a million uh, volunteers and you, the, his stage came in four pieces, pushed to the center of the field, bolted underneath. Michael was in a what we called a toaster pop-up piece underneath one of the pieces. Um, and and so that was, you know, that, that was that was how that happened. That's great. Um, if you guys uh, have questions, you can start uh, lining up at the, uh, the mic in the middle of uh, the second uh, step there. Um, so I want to go back to the trailer because okay. I, I watched it a, a few times now and picking up the, the quotes and the words of the inspiration and, and the flashing throughout that, uh, the words, turn up the volume on your dreams. Mm -hmm which I love. And so I'm asking you, how are you turning up the volume on your dreams? And, and what have you not yet accomplished that you still want to do? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, my heart and soul has always been 
in the space of diversity and best talent and giving people chances that otherwise wouldn't have chances to be part of a project or realize their dreams, whether it's a performing artist or a director or a writer or a friend, quite frankly. And I feel like I, the experience I had with putting Color Purple on Broadway, it, cha it changed the paradigm of who goes to shows. It also changed the paradigm because I hired women and African Americans to write the show. And if you think about the two most famous black musicals prior to Purple were Porgy and Bess and Dreamgirls, both written by white men. And my musical was written by three women and two African Americans. And that was in, I hired them in 1997, so it was way before this current conversation. And I feel like then changing who was coming to Broadway and giving producers and theater owners and investors permission after the Purple success to try more. So it allows for Hamilton. It allows for the Temptations musical. It allows for shows that are not all, you know, pristine white stories. And showing diverse people and their journeys on Broadway, I feel like I made a major contribution in Color Purple to making that happen. There's still a long way to go, um, but more and more artists are being hired and shows are being produced that are not traditional Rodgers and Hammerstein style musicals. Um, I haven't yet accomplished that in Hollywood, and so if you ask me what it, what is my dream to to accomplish, you know, before I'm six feet under, it's to do it now in Hollywood. And I feel like the two movies that are most uh, I have several projects that fit that bill, but the two movies that are you know, right around the corner are this one and The Color Purple. I also have another film with Latinx stars that are going, that's going to follow this, also set up at Warner Brothers with the same writer as this piece. I also have another movie that John, John Chu asked me to produce his next movie, so we're in the process of putting that together. I just bought the rights to something and we're going to write the screenplay and take it out to the market in about two months. Um, so my goal would be, as I'm, watching, um, as I'm watching what's happening in LA, which is happening faster now, quite frankly, than New York, which are minorities and diverse artists are getting lots and lots of jobs. And quite frankly, I will hire an African-American director to, to direct Color Purple, and I'm probably going to have to wait for somebody because the jobs are now so plentiful, way overdue, but really I'm really happy to see that. So, um, so that would be, yeah, that, that would be something I would love to accomplish. Okay. Any questions for Scott? Yes, that's, that's, say your name and, and if you're a student or you know, department, go for it. Hi. I'm Zoe, and I'm a BFA musical theater student, and I would love to hear the best piece of advice from your side of the table for aspiring performers. Which kind of performer are you? Um, hopefully Broadway, musical theater. Singer, dancer, actor, all of the above? All of the above. Well, casting agents are the first place for them to know about, and quite frankly, there's so much need for new talent I mean, really, honestly, the, the, the business is exploding between what's on Broadway and the number of tours that are out there and even other versions of productions like the cruise ships are now doing, you know, big, I, I produced a show years ago on Broadway that's now in its fifth year on Norwegian cruise lines called After Midnight. So there is a constant need for young, aspiring talent, and you just need to get seen. So I would, I would strongly suggest that if you have resume, picture, credits, any tape on yourself, if you could do a couple monologues or do any kind of work, if, if, if you are an excellent dancer, if you want to show that, put a tape together. First and foremost, probably the number one casting agent in New York is Bernie Telsey and Company. They do almost all of my shows. They even cast this movie. 
They do all of Disney's work. They do Lin Manuel's work. Um, they run six audition rooms a day from morning till night. Um, just get it to them. You know, send it to Craig Burns in uh, at, at Telsey and Company, and that's where. And, and then you're going to ultimately need to get there. Because people are auditioning every day. Um, sadly for you, nobody's going to give you a plane ticket to fly there. But if you're there, and they're auditioning, and you're good enough, and you're the right person, you'll get the job. I mean, I've hired multiple first-timers. Um, really, I've given people Broadway debuts many, 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 many times. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So Leslie Grace, who plays one of the characters, Lynn, uh, Anthony Ramos, um, all of these characters, when they saw the trailer, when they saw the rough cut of the movie, and they were in it, and they've seen the play, and they've read the script in auditions, and they all choked up, and they said, oh my god, this is us on the screen, we're finally represented on the screen. And, we're, and our story is being told in an incredibly authentic and aspirational way, and so and a respectful way. And I think that's really the key to this. I have to give our authors, Lin Manuel Miranda and Keanu Hudas, tremendous credit for writing it. We um, in the in the musical on Broadway, there was not a lock of dreamers storyline. We added that in to make it more present day because that musical was done in 2008 on Broadway. Um, John Chu is an incredibly sensitive artist and director. So it's about producers bringing material that represents the stories that you're talking about. And I think Black Panther broke the wall down. I mean, when Disney saw that that movie played worldwide and did what it did worldwide, um, suddenly everybody woke up. I mean, Disney just bought Hamilton. Now, granted, it's Hamilton. Doesn't take a brand surgeon to buy Hamilton. But they paid $75 million for it, and they're going to release it as a movie. They had nine cameras in the theater. Lynn, Jeffrey Seller, my friend who produced the show, and Tommy Kale, the director of the show, they self-funded the filming of that in the theater a year ago, and they put it out to auction. And Disney paid $75 million for it, just announced this week. So that movie will hit all over theaters. I think it's imperative that the buyers, our studios, networks, theater producers, are willing to take a chance and put up the financing and do the marketing properly and, and customize their marketing. You know, don't, don't make a spot for white people only. I mean, this movie will have no less than a half a dozen spots. You'll see. You'll watch. There will be there will be there will be Spanish-speaking spots on Telemundo. I guarantee you. Then there will be spots that will be on the Tonight Show, and then there will be spots on music channels. And then they, as you saw, they, I don't know if any of you saw, they bought a spot on the Grammy Awards um, a couple weeks ago. So they're going to hit multiple channels: music channels, theater lovers. Latin families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to be a scattered, multi uh, multiple-pronged uh, marketing approach to get the people in for this movie. And I think that what we need to do, we just need to make good stuff, and we need to make sure they're seen, and then we need to make sure they're sold. And, and trust me, all of these corporations are public corporations. They just want to make money. Not to say that they don't have an altruistic bone in their body, but because they do, and they're starting to hire people of color in decision-making jobs, which was not the case 20 years ago. 
So now all of a sudden you've got, you know, I've got a black executive on color purple. Um, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. So that's starting to happen, and I think, again, the more these projects are supported by the public, you know, if nobody goes, then they'll come to the conclusion that, well, we tried, didn't work, nobody wants to see that. So it's important that it's a two-way street. Thank you. Thank you. One of the students has some questions. Hi, it's Amber and Olivia. I'm an advertising senior student. I'm actually taking campaign class Yay. with Dr. Morris. I don't know. I, don't know. Oh, I know Dr. Morris. Okay. Well, he's been here a long time then. Um, uh, so while you were speaking, you mentioned some names of um, men who have been accused of sexual misconduct through the Me Too movement, like Harvey Weinstein and Dustin Hoffman. And I want to know your perspective on what's the responsibility of a producer to improve the entertainment industry. One thousand percent, no question. Believe the accuser, give them the benefit of the doubt, and don't go into business with people like that. And I won't and would not. And so that's, um, you will see, I mean, I shouldn't say this on your camera, but I mean, I, I intentionally, with lawyers, we pulled in the heights out of the Weinstein Company. And even though I had to deal with Dustin Hoffman in order to get the rights to Tootsie, I called him after, his, after he was accused. Um, I called his lawyer and I said, contractually I have an obligation to put his name in my ads. I'm respectfully asking to let me pull the names out of the ads. And we did. And his name has never appeared in any of the ads that I put, put on for my show. So I think it's, look, every, on this, at the same time, I'll say as a, a, you know, as a human being that we do live in a society where one should be innocent until proven guilty. I think the pendulum, while way overdue for time's up to occur, and it's really important that it did, I think it's also important that in the event that innocent people are accused, that there's some jurisprudence of some kind. And I think we're, we're, we moved very quickly to accused, you're fired tomorrow, and it seems like there needs to be some middle ground where there's an actual investigation, and then if it's proven in the case of like Matt Lauer, yeah, then fire his ass tomorrow, and we don't need to see him on the air again. I have another question, more lighthearted. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm an advertising senior, um, and one of my passions is film, and I kind of found like a very nice career space within the advertising major. So uh, with my passion of film and studying advertising, I think my, my career goal is to eventually go into film marketing. So I want to know what your advice is for going into like, Oh my God, marketing. you're my favorite person in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because, because if we're going to continue down the path of making stories that feature diverse characters, then we have to have marketers that understand that audience and know how to sell and speak to, not, not just sell, actually more importantly, knows how to speak to that audience. And because it's very easy to just go make a spot and, you know, and buy BET, for example. You know, yeah, you can, you can do that. But if you don't understand, which I came to understand um, over the time of, of Color Purple, if you, I mean, I remember sitting in the audience <clears throat> on an early preview with Oprah and Gail, and Oprah looks over to me and she says, you have no idea how many women feel redeemed from watching the show. I would have never in a million years thought of that perspective. I thought, I'm here to make a good entertainment. Sing, dance, tell the story well, hire a good cast, have beautiful sets, costumes, choreography. I never understood that. And so having her explain that to me, suddenly we were able to start to create some materials in the marketing space that didn't overtly talk about that, but it re referenced that. It let families know why mothers and daughters could come to the show together. It was a reason why, it was a reason I told you this story earlier today. That same night, the lights go up at half at intermission, and there's 10 
Chinese women sitting in the theater. And Gail walks over to them and says, why, why did you come to Color Purple? What, what about this show appeal to you? And this one woman says, that's us up there on that stage too. So suddenly you start to get revelations about the impact that your story has on people. And it suddenly made me then say, all right, I have to take this show to Africa. I have to take this show to China. I would have never thought to take Color Purple to China. So it's up to people in the marketing departments to really understand. I mean, when, when I told you Disney passed on In the Heights in 2015, and they said, we don't know how to market this show. That's embarrassing. They should have people in the marketing department that knew exactly how to market that show. I mean, they're the world family branded company of all time. So, and I love you, Disney. But, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's really important that across the board, the, the, the decision makers on who says yes, we're going to make this, or we're going to buy this from you, or we're going to develop this script from you, or if we do make it, people in marketing and distribution that know how to speak to the communities that this story addresses is essential. Otherwise, the system will never be perfect. And, 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 and as the stakes go higher, and movies start costing 50, 60, 100, or 200 million dollars, if they don't, if they don't nail it, literally on opening weekend, they've lost the they've lost the ball. They've lost the opportunity. So you should go for it. You should stuff. You should really work in not only the advertising stuff and the PR stuff and the promotion stuff. Look, go go take. I don't know if you're you're ready to graduate, but like you know, if you knew how to cut a trailer, edit a trailer, and knew how to tell, because what we do is we give an editing house, a trailer house, you know, two and a half hours of movie. And that, that is not exactly our film. We didn't, when, when that trailer was cut in December, we, they added some lines. They also, they also put strings um, underneath it, which I thought were incredibly powerful and boosted the emotional content of the, of the piece. They slow the strings down. The music cues on that are really, really fascinating if you watch it. And we didn't have string cues in our movie when this trailer was cut back in December. There are now string cues in our movie in the score because of the effectiveness of that. So as many disciplines as you can understand, um, you know, there's the print side, there's the trailer side, there's the digital side, but knowing how if you're a good storyteller, because it's really marketing at this point, if you're marketing entertainment, you're taking larger forms of entertainment and you're shrinking them down, which is hard. It's hard to tell, it's hard, really, really hard, to take a two and a half hour Broadway show and make a 30 second commercial. You don't have the time to tell the story arc of Tootsie in 30 seconds, I'm sorry. I mean, what we did was, there's a guy, and he did this, and he did that, and blah, blah, and then we show a lot of jumping around and dancing, and da, da, da. See Tootsie, it's the funniest thing on Broadway. I think that's a half-ass commercial. And I ran it, because I had no other choice. I had no other options to do that. When I move into the movie side, and the resources I get from here, like, I'm a pig in shit. Like, this is, this is like, oh my god. They will make, if they do research that 15-year-old girls want to see this movie, They'll make three TV spots for 15-year-old girls, in addition to the other 12. So I think Hollywood marketing, movie television marketing, cutting trailers, you know, doing promos for HBO, I mean, they do some really great, there's a lot of work out there for the right people. You need to just get your foot in the door in one of those companies, whether they're the in-house promotion department of the network, like HBO, or if they're farmed out to trailer houses or promo houses, um, that's a great thing. If you want to be in entertainment marketing, New York, LA, by and large. Thank you. You have video skills? Sorry. You have video skills? Video? Video editing skills, no, but I can't really get them. Scott, I really enjoyed your comments earlier today. One of the things that hit me was your uh, 
your suggestion that, uh, that students take advantage of all the opportunities that are here at the University of Florida, particularly starting freshman, sophomore, junior year. You could maybe share some of the things you shared earlier about how, how a student can utilize the resources of this community to prepare themselves for the, uh, the next stage of their lives. Yeah, I mean, I think, a lot of, I think a lot of students do partake, but I think a lot of students do not. And I think it's unfortunate because this university has a multitude of extracurricular within the academic space, outside of the academic space, to start to hone your professional skills while in school. And I just toured the journalism and communications building today. I was blown away. When I went to school here, we were in the other side of the stadium. We didn't have a fraction of the, of the resources that, you know, I mean, they have, what did I see today, 10 control rooms? I mean, it was like crazy. They were like running, they're running an NPR station from here. Um, a public broadcasting station from here, weather from here, sports from here. So I think that even since I graduated, between student government, depending on what your aspiration is career-wise, whether it's student government, whether it's sports, whether it's marketing promotion, whether it's the concert program, whether it's a lot of the organizations here in the Rights Union, whether it's different things that you can do um, outside, of, outside of the um, academic or inside the academic, use, you know, me going to work at WGGG as a radio DJ in, in college, like, gave me broadcast experience. And I knew when I, even later when I became a client, I knew how to cut a radio spot. And so those kinds of things, you don't have to wait until you leave here and then send a resume with, you know, here's my GPA, and here's a couple things I did in four years, and now please take a chance on me. I think you actually have a real opportunity in a university with these kind of resources to really build your resume with practical stuff, not just theoretical stuff. And, and it's all here. I mean, I'm shocked how, how much is here. And, and, you know, you can make a student film. You can, you can do short, I mean, there's, Jeffrey Katzenberg um, has, after leaving um, DreamWorks, started a new company called Quibi. Well, their, their, their model for storytelling is 10 minutes or less. They believe that people of your generation are going to use your phones, and you're not even maybe even going to watch one hour, two hour, three hour formats. That you're going to want you know, little 10 minute, three minute, four minute things. Um, I had a friend of mine who wants to do content and didn't know what distribution path they should take. And I brought them in to my talent agents in LA three days ago. And <clears throat> the more we talked, I said, why don't you make these for Quibi? You could do 100 three to five minute pieces for Quibi. They would buy them from you. It would, it would establish you. You could always go long form later. So I, I really do encourage students to take full advantage now look, you're in your freshman year, you're just getting your feet wet and trying to figure out whether you even like school or not or what it's like to be away from home. I get all that. But certainly by the time you're, you know, a sophomore, junior, you know, jump right in and start to take advantage of... And, and the other fun thing is you can play with stuff and find out you don't like it. And that's actually cool too. Like, I thought I wanted to be a, an actor. I thought I wanted to be a filmmaker. I thought I wanted to be a law student. Well, guess what? I don't. Okay. S pivot. You know, I've gone from advertising major to Radio City Music Hall, where I was effectively a concert promoter for X years, and then executive producer, then ran the company, then jumped into series television in LA, having never done scripted TV, produced six TV shows for Columbia TriStar, left there, jumped into Broadway, having never done Broadway, did Broadway, did my first movie, went back to Broadway, went back to movies, and all, all trying. And there were times that, and some stuff worked, and some stuff didn't work. And one of the greatest lessons you'll learn this out, you've heard this from a million people before, but failure can be your best friend sometimes. You know, try something, prove, learn from it, either learn, I never want to do this again. 
you know, never want to do this again, that was horrible, or, oh, if I would have done these three things differently next time, it, it will work. And I think this is the time to take full advantage. It's so much easier to just go to Leonardo's and go to a party and think, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that, but at the end of the day, there's so many resources here that you can take advantage of that I, I, I certainly did and didn't when I was here. But I think it's, but the things that have served me the best in my career were those extracurricular things that I did do here. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Scott. Uh, my name is Noel Drew. I went to high school at the same time you did, Gibbs. Uh, but I graduated in 77. Oh my gosh. So yeah. Go Gibbs. Hi. Go Gibbs. <laughs> I forgot you were the editor of the Gibsonian. Uh, I was sports editor a couple of years after you left. Um, but anyway, uh, I wanted to ask actually what, what teachers in high school influenced you, but then I also wanted to ask you what your role is once a production is underway or, um, or once a movie is being filmed. Do you still have an active role in that process? Yeah, I'll answer. I'll answer your second question first because my memory. I have to just. <clears throat> I did have a. I did have several teachers in, in in high school in Gibbs. I mean, we were we were. It was an unusual circumstance in Gibbs, as I told you. It was the first year of desegregation, and Gibbs was ninety percent black students, and probably was the least funded school in Pinellas County prior to our arrival, and one of the parts of the least funded aspect of the school was that all of our teachers were like 23. They were like right out of college. And, and so they were probably the least expensive teachers to have. Um, I viewed that in hindsight as a blessing, having, having teachers that were young enough to really relate to us and talk to us about all the things that we were trying to do. It was a remarkable time to be in that school and and interface with all those students and, and be the least funded, and yet we still have the best basketball team in the entire state. Um, on the production side, um, I follow my projects from the beginning to the end. As it, it, it's, the difference between theater and film is in the theater side, I'm practically, um, you know, I, I buy the, I have the idea, I go chase the rights, I fund buying the rights. I pay my lawyer to get the rights. I hire the creative team. I pay the creative team. I pay for workshops and all of that. I go to third party investors and raise millions of dollars and take it all the way through its Broadway production. And then, and then, all, then everybody, did, all the creative team disappears on opening night. I'm there to show run. I'm there to run marketing as long as the show stays on Broadway. So I do marketing, I do brand management, I start to work on further distribution, tours, international licensing, um, merchandise, all of the above, ever evolving, cat recasting, all of the above. In the movie side, you get the idea, you bring it into a studio, they put up all the money, they have the legal department, they have the marketing department, they have the distribution department, they have physical production that helps us. So my job on the movie was working with John Chu, Kiara, and Lin-Manuel for the last six years, getting the script in, space, in the place that we wanted to film it, getting the right studio to be our partner, organizing, hiring all the department heads for cameras and, elect and, and electrics and, and props and sound and all of, all of that cinematography, all of the, all the department heads being on set literally every day from June 3 to August 10, sometimes from 2 in the morning until noon the next day if we did it overnight, in the, you know, you'll see nighttime shots when you see this. Um, hiring 500 extras to, to do the pool, Busby Berkeley shot there, having, having a budget that gave us two days to do that. On the second day, thunderstorm shut us down. We had to I had to go to the studio and say I need $700,000 to come back for a third day. Um, got it, and did the third day. Um, so, yes, fully en engaged the, the, entire, the entire process. 
So Scott never sleeps, apparently. No. Right? <laughs> How, and I asked you this a little bit earlier. You have a lot of, you're juggling a lot of projects at the same time. How are you managing that? What's your team look like? You're, you're, you have a lot going on. I have on. a small staff. I have um, a head of theater, a head of film, and one assistant. Uh, theater's in New York, film's in L.A. I'm both places, more in L.A. now because of this. Um, and the good news is the, the calendar has not uh, overlapped. I mean, I literally, I opened Tootsie April 23rd on Broadway. The Tony nominations came out May 1. <clears throat> we got 11 nominations. Tony Awards were June 10. We started filming June 3. I stayed involved with Tootsie, but I had Carol really um, line producing Tootsie while I was on set. Ran that through the end of August, and then went on vacation for a month, and came back and we went right into the editing room and started putting more projects together. Any other questions for Scott? Hi. You so again. Yes. <laughs> I haven't seen West Side Story yet. Um, I'm, I'm a passive producer of company that opens this spring with Patti LuPone and Katrina Lang, um, where uh, Marianne Elliott, uh, a, a director from London, has taken the Sondheim classic and made Bobby a woman and made the married couple a gay couple. So she's turned it on its ear. So I'm part of that, This, but I'm not actively producing that. and. Um, and so I haven't seen West Side Story as yet. I will after it opens. But, um, but I, think, I think a couple things are happening in New York. There's a few things that are good and a few things that are bad. The, um, the good things are the innovation and the diversity continues to, to grow. And people are indeed using all different kinds of technology for storytelling. Sometimes it's more effective than others. Sometimes I think it's cold. And, and loses the intimacy, but in some cases it's really brilliant. The New York Times has started to embrace um, new work and, and feature new work where in five, six years ago, you know, if, if, if Bernadette Peters was doing a new musical, they put her on the cover of the arts and leisure section and ignore the new work. Now I think they realize they've got to pay attention to the new work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, we are uh, at the end of our program. I want to thank you all for for attending. And Scott, I just want to give you a round of applause. For oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This, I don't know, this typhoon Thursday. I don't know what's going on. And hopefully we'll get you back soon, uh, sooner than later. Oh, well, thank um, you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. Okay, thank you.